Hello Church. Welcome to the end of the book of Leviticus. I hope you have realized by this time that this has been a precious book and it's going to not let us down again in chapter 26 and 27. And so just real quick, well, we, some of the things that you might want to realize is this. I want to point out a lie that some people believe. Some people believe that in the New Testament we're saved by grace, which is true, and in the Old Testament they were saved by works. And now in the New Testament we're just saved by grace. And so we no, no longer have to do works. That's actually a lie. Do you realize that we have always been saved by grace? Even in the Old Testament, they were saved by grace. And in the New Testament, we're also still expected to do works. But the order is so critical to understand. And it's the same in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Let me just explain real quick. In the Old Testament, examples that we would point to as being obvious that they were saved by grace would be in Genesis chapter 15, uh, where Abraham believed the Lord, it was already credited to him as righteousness. In Exodus chapter 20, we recognize that before the Ten Commandments were given, they were already in a relationship with God. God had already set them free. They were in a relationship with him pre-law. And then there's Job and all that. That point has been very made very obvious. But when you get into chapter 26 of Leviticus here, you recognize that God sets things up in such a way that he longs to bless his, his children, but he makes it conditional upon obedience. And so one way of understanding this is that obedience does not earn our salvation, but it proves it. It's the same thing in the New Testament. In Ephesians chapter 2, it says, yes, we are saved by grace. But in verse 10 of that same chapter, it says, but God has prepared good works for us to do. And in, in James chapter 2, it says that if we don't do those good works after we've been saved, our faith is dead. Have we even been saved? Like those works have to follow. Jesus actually said something similar in John chapter 15, that if you love me, you will obey my commands. And so there's an expectancy that we will obey. And so here in chapter 26, we recognize that God just longs for his kids, kids to obey him. And he wants to pour out blessings on them and just pour it out richly on them. But it's conditional. But the, but the covenant he gave to Abraham, if you look at verse 44 40, and verse 45, was not conditional. It's a little bit like saying the, the, when God invites us into that relationship, that is not conditional. That is an unconditional invitation to have a relationship with him. But our participation in that is conditional based on our obedience. And that's what we see here. And so you'll notice that in verse 3, and verse 14 and 15, the word if is in there. It's conditional upon obedience or disobedience. And then when we get into the disobedience, even there you can see God's mercy in this chapter so many times. In verse 14, he says, here's what's going to happen if you disobey. He warns them ahead of time. That's very merciful. In verse 18, and even after they've disobeyed, if you're still persisting in disobedience, here's like a second level of judgment, if you want to call it that. In verse 21, another level. Verse 23, another. In spite of this, if you still disobey, then these things will happen. In verse 27, again, there's like progressive levels or natures of, of the judgment. And so verse 40 applies the whole time. He gives us an out. If you would confess, you can come back and receive this reward for your obedience. What a gracious and merciful God we serve. Amen. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. In chapter 27, maybe just a little thought about the first eight verses there. This is not, these are not verses about value. Our value was determined in Genesis chapter 1. Okay, so when there is a discrepancy in the number of shekels that between, uh, regarding somebody's gender or age, it is not based, that is, does not determine their value. But in an era where they were, this is essentially saying, how much work could this person do in an era where everything was done by physical labor? That's what this is reflecting. And then you'll recognize that really all of chapter 27 is about dedicating things to the Lord, whether it is a person, whether it's an animal, whether it's a house, or whether it's land. And you'll recognize that if you just glance over at verse, let's say 26 down to the end of the chapter, tithes and offerings, oh, sorry, tithes and the firstborn were, were not part of this voluntary offering. Those were already expected. That base level was already expected. 
all of these, de the dedicating of these things was all additional to that. And so there's like this, I always think of it like a three rung ladder. The base level, tithes, that's kind of expected level of giving back to the Lord. Offerings, like this whole chapter talks about, is optional. And you could already ask yourself, and then the third level is like extravagant offerings. But this would describe like that offerings level. And, and why would a person ever want to do that? You could park there and think, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, it says God loves a cheerful giver. Then you can ask yourself, would I have been so cheerful that even in the Old Testament, I would have done something above a tithe? Or even today, do I give cheerfully to the Lord? You could also ask yourself, if you go back to chapter 26, do I celebrate God's mercy? And do I thank him that I am saved by grace? Celebrate Jesus' 